four, three, two. Hello, 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 and good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Kiana Denae Perkins, and I am one of the co-hosts on The VU, which is the Church of the Larger Fellowships weekly video cast. Um, I, I see my fellow folks giggling. Um, I'm excited today. We're going to talk about Kwanzaa, um, which is, I'm going to not tell you nothing. I'm going to let you learn all about it. Um, and in that, um, I just want to let you know I'm here in um, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And it is maybe a little bit snowy. There's like a thin layer. It's still pretty. You could still take your dog on a little romp. Um, I will be staying on this side of my door. Um, but I want to turn it over to one of my co-hosts um, so they can share a little bit about where they are and what's going on for them. Aisha. Good morning, Kiana Denae. Uh, I'm Aisha Hauser, and I'm in Seattle, Washington, where it's rainy and dreary. It's a typical December here. Um, and uh, looking forward to today's show. I'm so excited. Chris Rivera. Hey, everyone. I'm Christine Nerivera. I'm coming to you from Augusta County, Virginia, and where it is snowing and sleet and ice and all of that kind of good stuff, which means, of course, here in Virginia, we just don't even know how to deal with that. So everything comes to a complete stop and, you know, <laughs> and all of the bread is gone from the grocery store shelves, um, even though, you know, it, the snow will probably be gone tomorrow or the day after. Um, but it is, it's, it wasn't the pretty kind of snow. It was just the really sweet, rainy, kind of rainy, yucky snow. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm looking outside right now. It's, I mean, it's pretty, but you know, what, what can you do? Michael, how you doing? I, I am doing just fine. Uh, welcome to the VU. It's Kiana Danae's host time, so it's the VU today. I love that. Uh, welcome, and uh, I'm here in Peekskill, New York, where we have about a foot and a half of beautiful, fluffy white snow, which normally I hate, but I have nowhere to go. So I'm looking out and just enjoying that it's pretty and beautiful and I have nowhere to go. It is a snow day from all remote school today here in Peekskill um, because... The kids don't have to get to school, so they might as well have the day off. Sure. So it's a snow day from all remote school, so you might get to meet the seven-year-old at some point if uh, her grandparents on FaceTime get tired of her. But it's uh, it's all good, and it's great to be here. And Tanner Linden is behind the chalice. You want to say hi, Tanner? Sure, and then I'll pass it to Dawn because I think Dawn's with us as well. Oh, Dawn uh, is here too. I, there, there are so many people. There are so <laughs> many people in this little strip at the top. Dawn is lots of people the on the show today. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm Tanner Linden. I'm the tech for the View, so I will be taking your comments from YouTube uh, chat and putting them over here so our hosts can answer live. So please comment in the chat, leave any questions. And if we don't get to it on the show, um, I can uh, ask our host to follow up and we'll, we'll get some answers for you. So um, any questions, just drop them in there and I will pass it to Dawn. Thank you, Tanner. Tanner, I want you to um, first make us all hate you just a little bit and tell us about your weather. Um, I... I am in <laughs> Southern California, uh, so no snow for me. Um, it's probably like a nice 62 right now. Um, and uh, that, that's it, it's sunny, but like not too sunny. You know, it's like that overcast type of sunny where the marine- okay, Oh, it's not burn. too that's sunny. Enough. It's just <laughs> like a little, just a little sunny. All right, that's enough. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Thank you, Tanner. Oh God. I'm Dawn Fortune. Um, I'm here in South Jersey um, at the shore, about 15 minutes from Atlantic City. And we didn't get any snow. Uh, we did get a bunch of rain um, and now it's just rotten cold. Um, and I'm, I'm a little bit jealous seeing all my friends with their pictures of, look, we've got snow. And I'm thinking, oh, sometimes I miss it and sometimes I don't. Today's one of the days when I miss it. So I'm going to hand it back to Kiana for uh, 
starting us off this morning. So, um, thank you, Don. I want to have a little PSA for just a second on the side over here. Um, recently, I've gone through a spiritual and emotional transition, and my name is, what I want to be called is Kiana Danae. Um, it is a learning process. We will all go through it together. I will change it where it needs to be changed, slow and steady. But I just ask that going forward, folks call me by Kiana Danae because that is the name I want to be called by. So that is my little PSA. Um, I do want to give a brief introduction to the four folks we've asked to come into our space today. If I say your name wrong, I apologize. I get nervous and then vocabulary gets a little wonky. Um, we were able to find four amazing folks uh, across the diaspora, across the country, who are willing to come talk to us about Kwanzaa today. First, we have Ghana Amani, um, and they are, can you tell us where you're at, Ghana? Absolutely. Am I on? You can hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, Ghana Imani, and I am in North Jersey, and I got all the snow that Dawn did not get. So I would love for Dawn to come up and take all of my snow away. Thank you very much. <laughs> then we have Ayana, who, Ayana, will you introduce yourself and share where you're at? Sure. Ayana Kasi. I am right outside of Atlanta on Occupied Creek land. And yeah, snow, I don't, I don't know her. <laughs> <laughs> she, don't, she don't come to your neighborhood. <laughs> I love it. Next up, we have Marcus, and I am not going to mess up your last name, Marcus, but I'm so glad you're here. Nice to be here. Uh, Reverend Marcus Foliano. Uh, I use they, them, their pronouns uh, based here in Chicago, Illinois, uh, and we are getting light, fluffy, little bit of snow, not what you're, what's happening out on the East Coast. And last but not least, we have Takia Amin. Where are you calling in from, Takia? Hello, I am Takia Nur Amin, and I am currently in Worcester, Ohio, where it is snowing, but I'm originally from Buffalo, New York, so snow is not a problem for me. That's right, that's right, that's right. Well, we're going to get this party started, y'all. I The first question is, what is Kwanzaa? And I'm going to let the floor be open to any of our guests who want to share. Uh, it looks like Ms. Takia, you want to go first? I'm happy to share. Uh, Kwanzaa is a celebration of Pan-African cultural heritage founded and established in 1966 um, through the work of Dr. Marlana Karenga, who is a part of the vanguard of Black studies. Um, I think it's important to say that Kwanzaa has been around now for more than 50 years. So while it may be someone's first Kwanzaa, um, every year is someone's first Kwanzaa, right? Which is wonderful and beautiful. But I think it's really important to lift up that um, the celebration has been around for more than five decades now, almost 60 years. And while it may be obscure uh, to some or unfamiliar, it is celebrated by thousands of people all around the globe, wherever African-American people have taken the observance. Um, as a celebration of Pan-African cultural heritage, Kwanzaa is a time for people of African descent to lift up and celebrate the best of our shared culture. Um, it is not meant to diminish the cultural differences that exist amongst African people in the diaspora, but it is a time to lift up and celebrate um, our shared history, our shared heritage, and the best of our cultural reality as we recognize our ongoing global struggle for liberation. So that's what Kwanzaa is, that's what Kwanzaa has been. Um, I should say again, Kwanzaa was established in 1966. My family started celebrating in 1967. Um, the city that I'm from, Buffalo, New York has been having public citywide Kwanzaa celebration since 1967. Um, so I've never had a year, I am 41 years old, I've never had a year of my life where Kwanzaa was not the tradition in my community and the tradition in my home. That's so rich, thank you so much. Is there other folks who'd like to add to that that history piece or give some more around that? I'm, I just watched a video that uh, Ghana produced um, that was actually really amazing. It's like this really like eight minute journey into Kwanzaa. Do you want to contribute to that, uh, to, to what Ms. Thakia just offered? 
why she said it all she took it from the top to the bottom i mean that was everything um <laughs> <laughs> no, she, I also was raised with Kwanzaa. My name, Ghana Imani, comes from Kwanzaa, Imani being the seventh day. Um, there's not a year I didn't celebrate Kwanzaa. However, I didn't always live in areas that celebrated Kwanzaa, depend on where I lived. So sometimes, I, luckily in the beginning I was, so it became kind of a cultural thing for me early on. But um I moved to the suburbs and then the suburbs didn't quite do Kwanzaa. So I was kind of an odd <laughs> man out. Um, but yes, you know, I've been celebrating for as long as it existed. So I feel you on that one. Um, so, yeah. Oh, so uh, if other folks want to pop in, you just got to, if you unmute yourself, then I can see you and then I'll make sure that you get to talk. Um, a lot of folks talk about Christmas and Kwanzaa. Do folks want to kind of dig into that a little bit about the non-existent fight between the two? <laughs> I think it's important to just be reminded that Kwanzaa is a cultural celebration, not a religious observance of any kind. Kwanzaa is- Can you break that down? Because I, I, I'm with you, but can you, can you break that down? Because cultural versus religious or faith, especially when we're on the VU, which is, you know, we're Unitarian Universalist or adjacent or close or, you know, attached to it somehow. How do we? Kwanzaa is not religious. It was intended to unite people of African descent across difference. I have a multi-faith family. My family has Muslims and Christians in it who celebrate their own individual religious celebrations. And on December 26th to January 1st, they celebrate Kwanzaa because they're black people and they're committed to lifting up the best of our Pan-African cultural heritage. So Kwanzaa doesn't replace Christmas or Hanukkah or any other um, celebration that is intended to have a religious valence. I think it's important to understand that in the 1960s, during the height of the black power and black arts movement, there was a real push to um, create context where a Pan-African consciousness could be celebrated and nurtured. This was also during the time that many nations in the Western part of the African continent and throughout the Caribbean were also um, seeking and fighting for their independence. And so this sense of a global connection with the struggles of African people was on the minds of lots of folks. Um, you will notice that the word Kwanzaa is from the Kiswahili language. Kwanzaa with one A means first, Kwanzaa with two A's, you find that meaning to expand, meaning first fruits or first fruits of the harvest, because the time of year when the celebration happens is typically a harvest season on the continent. And while we're here in the snow, many of us, and not necessarily reaping a physical harvest, it's the time to celebrate and lift up the cultural harvest of what people of African descent have given to the world together. So whether you consider yourself a religious person, a non-religious person, or something in between, again, Kwanzaa is a Pan-African celebration um, centered in the lives of people of African descent who choose to lift it up and observe. Thank you, Ayana. I think that also a key here is that the way you celebrate is just so different than Christmas. You know, Kwanzaa, at least from my experience, is a celebration of centering Blackness and centering Black joy. And I think that, you know, this year, especially, it's vital to center Black joy. All those who are going to be celebrating Kwanzaa this year you know, you've really got to dig into the joy, pour on the joy wherever you can. Um, so it's about family feasting. It's about supporting Blackness. It's about your personal history. It's about communal history. You know, I, I would say that the most important thing for my family when we celebrate is to have time together. You know, we, we love to eat together and we probably have five meals together a week as, you know, our, our pandemic pod. But, you know, this is important, the cooking together, the going through the tattered old um, cookbooks and, 
you know, selecting everyone's favorites and incorporating everyone's voices in the planning. You know, I'd also say buying black and, you know, if you're just going to do a really chill experience of ordering, you know, takeout, you know, supporting black businesses, that's to me part of Kwanzaa as well. And, you know, our Kwanzaa is a very introvert Kwanzaa. We don't really go out, but, you know, I, I do love the experience of centering who we are you know, and Christmas feels very different. And I'm just assuming because I've never celebrated Christmas. I have a deep curiosity. So if anyone wants to invite me over, I, I want to learn about this. But, you know, it just doesn't seem the same at all. You know, and even solstice celebrations, Hanukkah, it's just different. You know, so it's, it's about blackness, really. Friend Marcus? Yeah. Reverend Marcus? I think this is a, it's an interesting question uh, of is, is Kwanzaa replacing Christmas? Um, I, I sometimes uh, feel that question comes out of a, a little bit of uh, an ignorance of itself about what Christmas even is. Um, I, I, um, I, I just saw this morning one of my friends posting about Saturnalia starting on, on uh, the 23rd, which is a, a Roman pagan holiday uh, that um, is, is also a harvest celebration. Uh, a lot of Christmas, Christmas traditions come from Yule, which come from traditions from, from Saturnalia, which are, are these harvest celebrations that's around uh, gathering with, with family and, and uh, food and festivities. Uh, and a lot of the, the, the winter holidays, which there are many, center on this this harvest concept of, on this uh, this light and and candles and uh, really uh, meeting a new season um, that are all based in cultural identities uh, associated to that culture. Um, so I, uh, associated with the people that are, are celebrating this. Um, so I think that there's there's uh, even looking at the, the history of how Christmas has changed over time, uh, even in the United States at, at when it first, the United States was first around, Christmas was not really allowed in some states. Uh, it was seen as a, a, a pagan inappropriate holiday. Um, so I, th this, this notion um, that uh, it's something that can be replaced by another tradition that's using uh, some of the same um, aspects of that, that, that winter uh, light, warmth, festive harvest uh, uh, feeling is kind of is, is interesting to me. Um, I think that it's, it's very uh, in, important that we remember that uh, that Christmas is not the only <laughs> the only uh, winter festival uh, that's taking place at this time. Um, that that uh, that notion that Kwanzaa can replace it is kind of silly. <laughs> well, and I think for me, there's this buy into capitalism around Christmas that's really, 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 really hard for me. Like. As a culture, I've had a lot of economic pressure to make sure I get my kids a gajillion things and make sure that they have all of the stuff. But um, for me, and so we've done that, but it hasn't felt genuine and it hasn't felt like, um, what's a good word? It hasn't felt like I was setting us up for a brand new year. It hasn't felt like I was centering us for a moment so that we could move forward. It's felt like I bought you a bunch of shit. You opened it up. I said that, I'm sorry. Um, I said worse, keep going. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> um, it's like my mind caught it the moment after it came out my mouth, not before. Mind, we gotta talk. You gotta have a filter before. So it's like, I bought you a bunch of stuff. You opened it Christmas morning, we did the trash and now you're disappointed because you didn't get what you wanted and I'm disappointed I spent so much time and energy and money to get you something that was disappointing. And so Christmas for me, has become a very commercialized experience that I'm just trying to replicate so they don't feel like they don't have the experience of their friends. What it's disconnected from us growing as a family and growing into something bigger and better. And so I've learned to separate the two that December 25th is gonna happen. Y'all gonna do what y'all need to do because you're 10 and 12. But 
come the 26th, we about to light these candles and you about to have some essays to write about how you're connected to this, you know, the greater community. The key is dying over there. Well, just I think it's important to understand a few things. One is that while the observance of Kwanzaa is December 26th to January 1st, there are seven days of Kwanzaa and each day is tied to a principle. And part of the celebration and observance of Kwanzaa is lifting up the Nguzo Saba, that's Kiswahili for seven principles. Each day is tied to a principle. Part of the celebration and observance of Kwanzaa is taking time out to reflect on the principle of the day and how you embodied it that year, how you nurtured it, your goals coming into the new year. But it's also important to realize that those principles are relevant 365 days of the year. So in a family like mine, where Kwanzaa was what we did in December, we didn't only talk about the seven principles on December 26th to January 1st. It was not strange for my mother to say, you know, I have an older brother and a younger sister, for us to be kids and have my mother say, you know, now is that, you know, does that represent Umoja? You know, are you working in a spirit of unity? First principle of Kwanzaa. You know, I come home from school. I'm frustrated about something that's happening. Well, what about your Kuji Chagulia? What about your sense of self-determination? How can you apply that? So Kwanzaa, yes, is a discrete observance during those days, but the principles are relevant all the time. I also think that to the point of capitalism, I mean, in my life, I've seen Kwanzaa become increasingly capitalist as it has become more recognized. When I was a kid, Kwanzaa didn't show up on cartoons. There, it wasn't on Rugrats, it wasn't on the Proud Fan, you know, I didn't grow up seeing Kwanzaa in children's books other than the ones that were written by people in my local community. I remember 1992 because Kwanzaa was on the cover of Time Magazine and it was like the mainstream discovered Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa was in the Avon catalog that year. I remember you calling- get stamps. I could get stamps at the post office. I remember calling QVC and the Home Shopping Network because they were selling a Kwanzaa Christmas tree angel topper which is absolutely inappropriate and calling as, you know, what I have, me and my family have come to call ourselves sometimes as the unofficial Kwanzaa police and telling people that that was not an appropriate thing to sell. I remember when there were no Hallmark cards, there were no American greeting cards. You wanted Kwanzaa cards, you either made them or you bought them from somebody in your community who was making them. So on the one hand, as someone who loves Kwanzaa and what it represents, you know, the, if you go to the official Kwanzaa website, officialkwanzawebsite.org, or you read Dr. Karanga's book on Kwanzaa, which is widely available and in print, no reason not to know about Kwanzaa nowadays, um, there's a strong emphasis on giving gifts, particularly to children, in honor of their good deeds throughout the year. That, I think, is critically important. You didn't just get gifts during Kwanzaa because gift giving was happening. You got gifts during Kwanzaa in recognition of how you had lived into the principles during the year. And the gifts were intended to um, connect you to your heritage. So there was a strong emphasis on handmade gifts, on family gifts. My, me and my siblings, we would go to school and get teased because we got books a lot during Kwanzaa, but they were always books that we loved and enjoyed. Um, that was the way our family chose to do it, but it was really about lifting up and em embodying those principles. So now you can see Kwanzaa on Etsy. You can buy Kwanzaa wreaths and fabric and bows. And on the one hand, I'm glad to see that, that growing recognition, but I hope it doesn't take away from the initial intention and spirit of Kwanzaa, which was really about bringing black people and black community together to center our heritage, our joy and our struggle. And they did have rugrats on Kwanzaa, you know. They had a Kwanzaa Rugrats. That was a good one. <laughs> it was a Rugrats and the Proud family. And yes. Kwanzaa's been on Sesame Street. I mean, on the one hand, I love to see respectful representations and celebrations of Kwanzaa. But I will still call places and tell them if their candles are backwards on the Kanara or if something is missing on their Kwanzaa table or if I feel like there's been some kind of gross misrepresentation because Kwanzaa belongs to Black people. And no matter how commercial it becomes, I think we have to continue owning our cultural celebrations and what they mean to and for us. So I have two, two questions popping up. One, I wanna to go to, to Reverend Marcus because uh, Takia brought up something important, which is it's not just something you can celebrate December 26th through January 1st. Can you talk a little bit about how you practice it? And then the question, the other question I have behind that, which isn't explicitly for you, is what are some ways folks can celebrate Kwanzaa? So let's get into some practices or things that are 
beautiful about Kwanzaa that when it's celebrated, no matter what time of the year, are just beautiful. So first, Marcus, to talk about how they celebrate, and then we'll open the floor back up. Absolutely. So I, I want to kind of note that um, it, it's uh, interesting to, to hear uh, Tikia's experience with, with growing up with Kwanzaa, because um, it's been around for 50 years. Uh, I've only uh, really started uh, engaging with Kwanzaa probably about five years ago. So my, my introduction to Kwanzaa has been kind of this, this uh, Black capitalism uh, uh, frame uh, within my local community in Peoria, Illinois, um, which always seemed kind of problematic for me. Um, so I, I've, I've the, the spirit of Kwanzaa is something that I've really uh, personally uh, uh, adopted um, and uh, trying to uh, see how the, the, the principles um, and um, if the principles even are fitting the need that I need in this moment and that the community needs in this moment. Um, I, I know that some folks really struggle uh, each year uh, around um, some of the allegations uh, against uh, Dr. Karangi and, and uh, from uh, in his relationship with Kwanzaa. Um, so really making this a, 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 uh, a festival and holiday of, of black people and not about him um, is, is important um, and vital. Um, how I've uh, engaged with Kwanzaa personally ha has been to not necessarily look at the, the, the seven principles that are, are um, associated with Kwanzaa. I started doing that this year um, and looking, doing my own research into African um, proverbs and and principles and, and seeing which ones uh, are meaningful and and bring meaning and to, to what I need uh, in the moment um, what I what I actually did this year is I, I moved Kwanzaa to uh, October 31st um, and uh, I will do it again at the end uh, uh, on the actual time of Kwanzaa but with the election coming up I, I felt my spirit uh, feeling very low uh, and I needed to focus on some principles and um, I, I uh, adopted Kwanzaa to to uh, be associated with um, uh, All Hallows Eve, uh, All Souls Day, and All Saints Day. Uh, so those first three days, those first three candles, really uh, thinking about my ancestors, my personal ancestors, uh, the uh, communal ancestors, and, and the place that, that uh, my ancestors have called home. Um, and then on the fourth day, uh, a, uh, about being in the present, um, and what uh, my, my uh, life, what, what um, I need in the present. And uh, the, the green candles, the, the last three days uh, were about aspirational, um, being there for the community uh, to uh, 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 create um, what we need for, for the people that would call me ancestor someday. Um, so these, these are some of the, the, the things that are built into the spirit of Kwanzaa um, that uh, I, I adapted personally uh, to to fill a, a, a spiritual need that I needed at, in this moment, um, specifically around the election time. Um, so I, I think that that the spirit of Kwanzaa is, is uh, something that can definitely live outside of of um, the, the the specific traditions. Um, I think that that's something that. Uh, Unitarian Universalists love to do <laughs> uh, to 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 uh, make our traditions meet our our the the need of the 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 current culture. Um, and, but hearing uh, Takia talk about the the spirit of Kwanzaa has been um, really moving for for me and and trying to separate um, what I've I've come into, which is kind of a capitalist Kwanzaa and um, and uh, a a controversy around the founder. Mm. Those, thank you, Marcus. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to just add really briefly before we go into to actual practice stuff. One of the things I've been trying to do is flip the calendar. And by that, I mean, I'm trying to use Black August as an opportunity to, 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 to ground myself in my present. I'm trying to use Kwanzaa as a way to ground myself in what I want to be the future. And I'm trying to use Black History Month as a way to ground myself in, in my ancestors and my history. And then Kwanzaa and Juneteenth is kind of these button button moments of like where community can check in with those. So definitely trying to 
as you were saying, Reverend Marcus, trying to like reevaluate and using tools that I know are effective at times that when I need them, as opposed to when the world says I'm supposed to do them. <laughs> like, nope, I need this now. I'm gonna go get this now. Um, and I think that's really important that just to, I guess I just want to call out like as black people and people of the diaspora, we've consistently had to find ways to make a way, right? We have to make a way and we might not be able to make a way on December 25th, but on January 1st, when that paycheck comes, you're going to get what you need. You might not be able to take a big rest in August, but come September 1st, you might be able to take a two week vacation. So there is this call and this pull, I think, to use the tool, like to get the biggest tool basket possible and use it when you need it, not just when it's a set time. So to speak to that a little bit, um, Ghana, can you speak to a little bit about can, uh, about the place setting, the candles and some of the activities folks can do during this to observe and truly celebrate Kwanzaa? Absolutely. There are so many things you can do to celebrate. And the, the great thing about it being Pan-African is there's not one particular way. It's a history. It's a celebration of our people. Um, we in the community, in the Black community, uh, are always struggling with what to name ourselves. This is the time to name ourselves and call ourselves what we are and what we want to be. So when I say Black, I'm talking about Caribbean people. I'm talking about anyone whose ancestors were from Africa and got dropped off wherever they got dropped off, assimilated into whatever culture they got assimilated to because they were forced to, and then later realized, wait a minute, my grandma, 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 grandma didn't do that. What did they do? And that's what it's about reclaiming um, what was stolen from us. Uh, there's a huge difference with immigrants that came here and got to keep their language, keep their name, keep their customs, even if they had to hide them in the house and be a certain way. America is so much about assimilation. That's also what happens to these holidays. They get assimilated um, and we have to save everything. Um, and I know this wasn't the question, but I just want to touch really quick on Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving is trash in its real form. Like if you really go to the pilgrims and the natives, it's trash. And then there was another form of Thanksgiving later that became what was championed um, as our current Thanksgiving. That had nothing to do, had more to do with the civil war and the countries coming back together, North and South. Um, and there was a woman who spent 35 years championing Thanksgiving to what it is now. So what we all do to reconcile is go, mm, it's about gratitude. What am I thankful for? I'm grateful for my family, my health. And we sit around the table and eat that good meal and think about it. It's the same thing. I don't think about Karanga. I'm grateful for the discovery, but I don't think about him personally when I embrace the principles and the celebration. It's so much bigger than him. It's so much bigger than any of us. Just the way we sit there and have Thanksgiving, just the way Christmas, we think about, you know, being a blessing unto others more than, you know, to ourselves, things of that nature. Kwanzaa is that bigger celebration. Now, what we do in our family, we do go out um, pre-corona times, of course, and we usually celebrate if not at museums and local, um, like a lot of libraries and museums will have Kwanzaa celebrations with dancers, storytellers, griots, um, you know, books for sale that are African um, and all of those types of things. So we'll do that some days, but the nights we, we visit each other's homes. So there'll be families that will have their Kwanzaa celebrations on certain days and we will go to those homes and celebrate. And we always review the Ingazo Saba. We always review, you know, the seven principles. Um, so that's really important and light a candle. So that's just how I've been. So in the seven days, I'll probably go to five different people's houses, which is so much fun. And I love that so much. Um, the mat represents Africa. Um, the candle holder, and I'm giving a very quick, brief, watered down version of this. The candle holder is to hold the seven days for the seven principles. The corn represents the children in the family, or if there's no children in the family, you have corn representing the children in the community at large. Then there's the fruits of the harvest, since it's called first fruits of the harvest. So you literally have 
Um, we put a lot of fruits down. Sometimes we put squash and potatoes and things of that nature as well. That also represents the people who who planted the harvest. Um, and then there's the unity cup, which represents the first principle. And that's how we pour out the libations to the ancestors and other things like that. Um, did I forget anything? Is that all seven? What I get? You got the Bendera Ya Taifa, which is the flag, the liberation flag, Pan-African flag that represent our global struggle as people of African descent, the red, black, and green flag. You right. also want to make sure that you have, um, if you can, an image of the principles, a poster, a bookmark, something with the principles listed on it as a part of the traditional celebration and the Zawadi, the gifts. The gifts, the, the gifts. Day. That's it. That's what I was missing. Thank you. Out of my out of my seven. Absolutely. And and I hear you on the gifts. So um, when I was growing up, it was absolutely educational gifts. Not that they couldn't be fun. We had fun games and, you know, um, black dolls were a big thing because anything that wasn't available much in a black or African form and your parents could find that and get that, it was okay that it was capitalism because it was a black doll so they if they found a black doll and it happened to be in walmart or kmart or wherever it, the point wasn't the commercial the capitalism the point was bringing black things into the home so we have to have that balance um of what capitalism means for us it doesn't just mean oh i gotta go buy you a whole bunch of gifts what it means is giving you something intentional. I remember one year I made coupons and I ma made for the family like different chores or different hobbies. I'll bake a pie with you or I'll help clean your room or I'll help do things. So that was my gift, this little coupon book. So a lot of times it's homemade gifts. Um, but yeah, the capitalism thing, you have control just like you have control over Christmas. You have control over the capitalism in Kwanzaa. So that has never been an issue for my family. I wanted to to let Ayana jump in here because they've been you've been celebrating Kwanzaa your whole life, and that to me I'm just like I praise your parents, I praise your grandparents. I'm like yes, and I want my kids to be able to say that. Um, they'll say they celebrated most of their lives, but if you could offer some of the things that happen in your family celebration, that would be really beautiful. Sure, um, I'll also say that I grew up UU, so it was an interesting experienced, you know, marrying the two, but it also feels like it goes together very well. Um, so one year, I, I don't know how, but I think my dad got the whole week off, um, which is wild. But, you know, I remember us pulling together all of our change and taking it to one of those, you know, change, exchange places and um, we decided together to do an activity with the money we had pulled together. You know, something super simple, super small like that. I remember always getting black Barbies. <laughs> I think I had one white Barbie, but there were like all these different shades of Barbies that I had. And my mom gave me scraps of her different African cloth because she had to make our um, Kwanzaa clothes when I was young. Uh, but I remember like piecing together little dresses for them. You know, that's a lovely Kaumba activity, you know, and I'm, I'm going from a religious education lens, but I'm always thinking about the kids, like what is simple, what is fun. So, you know, having, just, mm. having these teeny moments that you can connect in with the principles is so vital. You know, our children aren't going to remember, you know, what everything stands for, except for the corn. They're going to know that the corn is for them. But, you know, saying, okay, we're going to learn something new and something that we've deeply we deeply desire to do on Nia and we're going to do it with that purpose and it's going to carry us through the rest of the year you know every year well maybe about three years we've been having a Imani brunch so you know it's late in the morning because we have a lot of people in their 20s in our family 
but you know we gather together we have a brunch we talk about resolutions or goals we burn bay leaves and let go of the past year you know there's lots of just teeny practices that you can do to you know really engage with a sense of play around kwanzaa i'm all about that like make it fun and it's also a time that if you want to you know affirm something that's a great time like a naming affirmation service you know you can do that within your family or within your community just gather together and affirm someone's name if they have a name change if they're taking on a new name a new version of their name if if you want to have a celebration for your ancestors this is an amazing time to do that there's there's endless possibilities, especially if you let yourself just go with it and have an experience instead of, you know, feeling any pressure to not be capitalistic, because I feel that pressure myself. I'm balancing between what's enough gifts for my child and what is a ridiculous amount of gifts for my child. You know, we all straddle that line. Um, but I think that some of those practices can be incorporated even if you're not Black, if you want to center Blackness during this time, you can, you know, have times to lift up, you know, our amazing Black UUs of our community, you can have time to amplify voices in different Black organizations. You can do a little studying around that. You know, that's that's an amazing way to have a Kwanzaa as a white person or to experience Kwanzaa when you have Black family members, but you are not yourself Black. Um, I wanted to just jump in there and say about kids. So for those of you who don't know, I run a little program called Blueberries for Black Lives and Unitarian Universalist. And we celebrated Kwanzaa last week. And, you know, it's about being age appropriate, right? So what my older kids who are 14, 15 can handle and remember is different than my kindergartners. So we read a book. You shaking your head, Takia, but we have an hour. Like so, for me, I made sure we read a book. We had an ancestor, and I'm sorry, a living elder, come talk about their experience with Kwanzaa and how they celebrated. Um, we talked about the seven uh, things that make up your, um, you know, your altar, for lack of a better word, right this second. So we, you know, gave them an age appropriate kind of perspective and a little bit of time that we had with them. But I think it's so important to introduce it in a way that's edible, and by that I mean palatable. If we tried to put all of this, cram this down very detailed, it would be overwhelming. But just even getting kids to say Kwanzaa, to talk about something other than Christmas and Santa Claus, I think is a feat um, sometimes in our culture. And Ms. Takia is just shaking her head. I want to make sure- I'm over here taking issue with all of this. Our children, okay, come on. Because our children will learn what we teach them. That's right. And our children will learn what we model. Oh, those words are so big. I knew all seven principles in Swahili and English by the time I was five years old because my family made it a point that this was important and it was what I needed to know. The same way I had to learn my own name and how to tie my shoes and my grandmother's phone number, I had to know what Kwanzaa was and what the seven principles were. So this whole like dance we're doing around children and young people and bringing them in and what is age appropriate. I am so sensitive to that. And also we need to challenge ourselves and believe in our children. One of the things that Kwanzaa asks us to do is to believe in ourselves, believe in our ancestors and believe in the spirit that grounds us, that spirit of life, right? And I think one of the practices that sometimes gets overlooked because it can be seen as less fun is let your children be a part of setting up the Kwanzaa table. That is absolutely a critical practice. The same way that people might let their children bake cookies for Christmas or be a part of developing a Hanukkah table setting or putting Christmas lights on a tree, cleaning the space where you're going to put your Kwanzaa table, 
going over the names of each thing that goes on the table, explaining the objects. You know, Kwanzaa has a lot of flexibility in terms of the things you can bring to its celebration, but there are also certain practices that are as they are for a reason. For example, we light the black candle first and then a red candle and then a green candle and then proceed red and green for the remainder of lighting the canara. Why? Because everything we do starts with black people, which is what that black candle in the center means. And the red candles, which signify sacrifice and struggle, come before the green, which symbolize prosperity and wealth. So there are internal logics to Kwanzaa that might be less obvious, which require us to study and continue engaging our young people so that they will not only carry the tradition forward, but also have some ownership of it. So let me back up, let me own what I was saying and, and we can come back a little bit, but it, we're getting close to the end of this hour. In the context in which I have these children, which is literally 60 minutes, maybe 75, there is a little bit of content. There is a, a chunk of content I can provide knowing that it may or may not be backed up at home. Doing online education for children is intense. It is hard. And we have kids who are young as kindergarten. And then I have somebody who's 17. So the level of so I have to make sure that we're delivering things that are age appropriate because there's just some things Mina's not going to get. She's seven years old. And there's, you know, so I guess what I'm trying to say is we are doing our very best. Let me back up. I'm doing my very best with the steering committee that I have to bring Kwanzaa to black kids who maybe have never experienced it before. And it may have not been perfect, but it was the best that we could offer given the time, the other jobs that we all have and the other things that we are trying to do in our community. So I guess I actually, the reason I came back around to this was just to say that we have an obligation to introduce Kwanzaa to our children as much as we are available. I've never owned a Kanara, but my kids know what Kwanzaa is. I finally ordered one and it's gonna come in the mail. And you're right, I am their first spiritual role model. I am the person who they need to learn things from. So I'm doing my very best, but I can't be everybody's mama and, and blueberries spiritual role model. I'm trying, I'm doing my damnedest, but it's not, um, it is, it's an intense amount of time. Um, Ayana has her hand up and then we wanna move into how folks can celebrate who maybe aren't, what, who aren't black or from the diaspora. And I brought that up particularly because I have some families who their children are black, but their parents are not. And I don't want them to miss out on this cultural celebration because their parents aren't black. Um, so Ayana is shaking their head a bunch and then we'll open the floor back up. I want to name that I did grow up with a very strong ritual around the Kwanzaa, the candle lighting, you know, I, I knew all the words and, meet, and meanings as well. You know, my daughter's learning um, as much as she is emotionally available. But, you know, there's, everyone has a different entry point and, I, I think that in the best circumstances, it would be ritual first, act, family feasting second, activities and fun and play third. But I think that, you know, especially in UU spaces, sometimes you do have to lead with the fun to, you know, pull people into the educational components, you know, and they're, there's a pretty solid difference between, you know, what you do in your own home, how you celebrate and, you know, communal celebrations. I think that communal celebrations should be more fun. There should be an ability to play and experiment and try things that are wild and maybe out of the ordinary. You know, maybe when you're you're just doing book club, Kwanzaa book club, and the next year you're bringing in artists from the community and whatever you can imagine. But I will agree that the rituals are what I remember from my childhood and the food. But the ritual is really solid. I could probably do it completely uncaffeinated and not miss a beat. And I also think that the setting up is a really, can be really fun. Put on some music and, you know, talk
talk about why you're doing each thing. Kids love conversation. Kids love to talk. It, it's just a fact that I have experienced in, you know, talking them through everything and having them discover the logic of Kwanzaa for the first time is magic. It, it's Kwanzaa magic right there. And you will experience the, dare I say, Kwanzaa miracle of, you know, their heart expanding and really taking the ownership of Kwanzaa. So fun, yes, ritual, yes. On that note of music, there, there are some uh, great uh, Kwanzaa playlists on on Hulu, not Hulu, um, uh, on Apple Music and uh, what is the other one? I, it's not Hulu, it's another green one. Oh, Spotify. So there, there's some great uh, Kwanzaa, Kwanzaa uh, playlists that are already made. And I know that Blue has some playlists too. Um, and I, I just want to, to also name that, that it's, it's exciting for me to see the through line uh, of uh, Unitarian Universalism within Kwanzaa, both uh, within uh, UU families um, and how the, the Black Affairs Council uh, in the 60s, uh, in the beginning of Kwanzaa, were, were able to help uh, fund some events across the country, uh, many in California. So we're at about that 12, so yes to Kia, and then we're gonna start to wrap up. Before there were playlists, we wrote our own songs. So before there were playlists, if you needed a song to teach principles to your kids, you made your own. Use this, use this as an opportunity to be creative. I remember 1980 something when my mother wanted us to learn more about Kwanzaa and was struggling teaching seventh and eighth graders. She wrote a rap about Kwanzaa. So this is our celebration. It's ours, we have to lead, we have to drive this car from the front. And if there's something you need that doesn't seem readily available, we have to make it ourselves. Kwanzaa is ours and we have to keep it so. So to come back around as we come to the, the end of the hour, we have about seven minutes left. Um, I wanted to share and let folks, other folks share. If there's other Kwanzaa happenings that folks can connect with, um, I will share that Blue Team Sankofa has things lined up. Um, we are doing seven, the seven principles aligned with the UU principles each night of Kwanzaa. You can come see that if you are um, identify as black. And then um, we will actually on January 1st have a, a larger celebration. And I know what it's called, but I can't think of how to pronounce it right this second. So I'm not saying it, but um, there will be events happening if you are um, a person who identifies as black and you um, can hear about those events in the blue closed um, Facebook page. Um, I know my community here in, at UUAA, the thing that we do is we post to the principal. Um, I have seven folks, black folks in the community, write about each one of the principles and how it connects to their life and how they're gonna use it for the next year. And we post those online um, to kind of balance out the public desire to learn more about Kwanzaa, which is like one of this, this events, more of like a public you know, educational moment. And then also honoring the privateness that there's a level at which we wanna be private. So we're having a brunch um, event on Saturday. So trying to balance out being educational, but also there's a sacredness and black space um, that happens and we don't want to diminish that at all. So is there other happenings in the community that folks want to share? Chris, Michael, Aisha, you, Tanner, you guys have been quiet, which is good. Yeah, and I, if you guys know about stuff, I want to make sure you share it too. <laughs> I will I will share briefly that uh, the December 27th worship service at the Church of the Larger Fellowship uh, 8 p.m. Eastern will be led by um, Antonia Bel Delgado and Althea Smith, who will be uh, celebrating Kwanzaa from their perspective. Um, so uh, that it is open for all to to participate and learn. Um, but the voices will be those of Antonia and Althea. So. Other things going on, Ghana, it seems like you had this amazing video. I don't know if you want to share that publicly for folks to use as a tool or um, how you want folks to engage with that amazing video, but I think I thought it was amazing. I'm going to use it. <laughs> Thank you. I have two videos, um, one that is for adults and one that is for uh, older children, elementary and kindergarten. Um, 
not so much those ages, but like middle school and high school. Um, if anyone's interested, they can email me and I can give them the link um, just because I'm careful about how I share my intellectual property. Exactly. But, uh, yes, but I definitely use it as a tool to ease people into Kwanzaa. Um, and so for in terms of activities, I am not the one to ask with COVID, pre-COVID, oh girl, I had the list for you for New Jersey. I had the <laughs> list for New Jersey and New York because I spent half my time in Brooklyn. In, um, we lived in Brooklyn for 20 years. So I have a lot of Brooklyn fam that does Kwanzaa and I could tell you all the things that BAM and you know, Newark Museum and this, uh, but COVID, I don't know who doing what. We having Kwanzaa at home. We doing some, you know, Zoom Kwanzaa. So I, I unfortunately, but next year, invite me back and I will give you the list for New Jersey and New York <laughs> for Kwanzaa. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ayana and uh, Reverend Marcus and then Takia for the last word and then we're going to close up. I am preaching about Kwanzaa on the 27th. U-U-F-S-M-A dot org. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. It's not in my time zone. So, you know, it, it'll just be interesting. Can you give us the definition of the, the breakdown, the letters you just said? U-U-F-C-M-J-Q-Y, what'd you say? <laughs> oh, um, what does it stand I for though? <laughs> It is a UU fellowship in Mexico. And I, every time I have said their name, it has been wrong. So I've just been doing the acronyms until I can get it in my mouth correctly. I don't like to verbally put the wrong words into an environment. No, I'm with you. Is, um, oh, San Miguel de... Alan? De Allende. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Reverend you. Marcus and then Reverend uh, Takia. Um, I know that I'm, I'm uh, doing a service for Gainesville uh, on Kwanzaa. Um, and of course, at this moment, I can't, uh, I can't, I think it's January 2nd, <laughs> not January 3rd, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> So um, uh, Takia, and then we'll close out the, the, the VU however we need to. I love saying that because I see my co-host all giggle. So um, I'll let you all have the last word, but I wanna make sure Ms. Takia gets a chance to, to speak. I would just say very briefly, um, we already lifted up the blue programming that's happening for Kwanzaa. I would just say that for non-black folks or folks who don't identify as black and members of the African diaspora, Kwanzaa is a great time to practice decentering yourself and lifting up um, uh, critical commitments to Black people and Black community, reflecting on what that means for you in your own families and in your own communities. It's a great time to educate yourself, to support Black businesses, and to be a guest in someone else's celebration. My whole life, we've had white folks, other folks be a part of my family's Kwanzaa celebration. And we always welcome those folks as guests to our celebration. And it's always joyful and happy. I think for parents of black children who might not be black themselves, um, providing resources for your children to learn about Kwanzaa and then allowing them to lead if they choose to with bringing that celebration into the family is the way to go. But it's a great time to practice what it means to be a guest in someone else's tradition. Mm, thank you. So, um, Chris, Michael, or Aisha, did you have anything you wanted to add? Thank you for this. My dogs are going crazy. So I just want to say thank you, everyone. Yes. I didn't forget Don and Tanner, if there's anything you want to add. This is not a time to center my white voice, but thank you. Okay, now we will end with that. This is not a time to center my white voice. Thank you all for being here with us. We love and appreciate you. We are on um, rest next week and the week after that. So we're on a two week break so that we can take care of ourselves and celebrate whatever um, is calling break. our hearts. We're not coming back until, no, no, wait. Yeah, and it, we're taking a three week break. Three week, week break. Hi, I just got a vacation day. <laughs> we'll be back the 14th of January. 
Whoop, whoop. Well, we'll see you guys then. Much love and appreciation to all of our guests and to my co-host team. I love you.